never, listen here for our church, we can never be successful giant killer. We can never rise above our circumstances when we don't hold up to the other side of our own bargain, regard. We make a lot of bargain, we make a lot of promises, sometimes we never keep. And we ask, our, we ask when, when we come to situation corners in life where we face tough times, we say, God, where are you? How many times God has whispered in a still small voice in our heart, hey, I'm still here. But where were you when I was looking for you? Where were you when I need you? Where were you when I need you all support for the kingdom? Let's look into David and his relationship with Mephibosheth. Let's look at how David, in spite of all the trying and testing, he still kept his promise to Jonathan. Are you with me? Two things. One, David, a promise-keeping king. David, a promise-keeping king. You know, as I preach the word this morning, I also speak to myself as well. I also preach to myself. Hey, do you keep promises? I do hope every one of us who are here in Tabernacle of Worship, you know one of the reasons why we do what we do here in Tabernacle of Worship, we preach what we preach, we teach what we teach here in Tabernacle of Worship is that so that you will grow, so that you will know what it means to be a real Christian, so that you will know what it means to be faithful, so that you will know what it means to understand the love, the faithfulness, and the kindness of God. Really. God is not a slot machine or an ATM bank, an ATM machine. When you need money, when you need Him, you go there and you plug it in. God is not a slave that we call when we need His help, but God is a friend. He is our saviour. He wants us to build relationship and kindness and build friendship with all the time. David, a promise-keeping king. King David's life couldn't be better. He was crowned in chapter Samuel chapter uh, 9, verses 1. Uh, chapter, 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 uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 9, you realize he was just crowned. His throne smells so fresh and so new. He just sits on the set on the throne. He was a king. Israel's enemy maintained their distance when King David became the king. The days of running away from King Saul was over. It was a distant memory. But then David, when he was crowned, he remembered a promise. He remembered a promise he made to Jonathan. When Saul threatened to kill David, Jonathan fought to save him. Jonathan succeeded and asked David to show loving kindness to him. He said, if I die, Jonathan said to David, I want you to show loving kindness to my family. I want you to make a promise, should I die? that you'll make sure when you are the king that you will take care of my family. You will not cut the root off from my line. He asked Jonathan, Jonathan asked David to keep the promise, made a promise. Where was the promise found? 1 Samuel 20. Everybody look at it. Verses 14 to 15. It goes this way. Put it up. But show me an failing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family not even when the Lord cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth Jonathan made David to make a, keep a, make a promise and David kept the promise through the time of war, to the time of Jonathan's death and, and Saul's death and to the time of defeating all the enemies, David in a, in, in never forgot the promise he kept, he gave to Jonathan. Jonathan died 
but David's promise did not die. One more time, Jonathan died, but David's promise did not die. To David, a covenant is no small matter. You know, to us today, making promises is a small matter. Well, I make a promise because you know why? I just want to make a promise. But it can, whether I can keep it or not, I bet that is second, second, secondary. A promise is a promise, no matter how bad, how serious a promise is, it's still a promise. There will come a time God will ask us to account for our promises that we made to Him. Whether you are like it or not. Yeah, if I made a promise to God as a pastor, even as a Christian myself, there will come a time if I don't keep my promise, when I meet my God face to face, He will ask me all the promises I made to Him. Why I promised and I never kept. And He will tell you this one thing, I made my promises to you, I kept it till the day you die. Hello. Don't you think so? As human beings, we take for granted promises made, not kept. Hmm? Don't you think we as Christians, we, we make so many promises to God, we make so many promises to people, we don't keep them? A, slion, a, 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 a giant killer, a giant slayer is a man of his word is a man of his word or her word. When you catalog the giants David faced, be sure the word promise survives the cut and make the short list. How about you, husband making promises to wife, wife to husband? How about you, children making promises to parents? Mom, dad, when you grow old, I will take care of you. <laughs> I will make sure I provide for your need. I will not kick you to the old folks home. Huh? I will make sure when I earn my money, I will send you for a holiday. You have never been out of Malaysia, but I'll make sure you get out of Malaysia. I will make sure when, when I get married one day, I will remember your kindness, your provision. I will never fail to come back to visit you. Promises. The story entered here in 2 Samuel chapter 9 is a man by the name Mephibosheth. The advisors of David summoned Ziba, a former servant of Saul. Did he know of a surviving member of Saul's household? Take a good look at Ziba's answer. Ziba said, there is still a son of Jonathan. His name, he's, he is lame in both feet. Do you know Ziba never even mentioned Mephibosheth's name? Do you notice? He never mentioned the name. No name was mentioned by Ziba. Just points out that this boy is lame, right? We sense a teeny well, disclaimer in his word, he, yeah, what he was trying to say to David, David, be careful. He isn't. How you will say it will be suited for the palace. You might think twice. You should think twice before you keep the promise. He is not what you expected him to be. He's a lame and is not fit to sit at the king's table and live in the king's palace. Why was... Mephibosheth lame because when Mephibosheth was five years old, his father and grandfather died in the hands of the Philistines. Knowing their brutality, the Philistine, the family of Saul, hated for the hills. Mephibosheth's nurse snatched him and ran, and then she tripped over and dropped the boy, breaking both his anger and living incurably lame. Escaping servants carried him across Jordan River to an inhospitable, inhospitable village by the name La Diba. What does La Diba mean? La Diba simply means without pasture. 
it is a dry desert, full of rocks and hot hills. No grass, no water. It is a very difficult place. Can you imagine? No hospital, nowhere for people to take care. She is so mephibosheth couldn't heal, couldn't recover. He became lame. Mephibosheth hid there, first for fear of the Philistine, then for fear of David. Do you know when David became king, he was still hiding there in the desert, a land of hopelessness, a land where there is no ability to rise and get up from. It's just like Lodiba is like a, 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 a place of dryness, a place of hopelessness, a place where there is no future. Are you in a situation there seems to be no future? Are you in an environment where life seems to be so tough, so difficult, you're not able to rise up again and again and again? You fail and fail and fail and fail again. <laughs> he was victimized, he was ostracized, he was disabled. He was uncultured. He never learned how to eat properly. He is brought to the palace and fearfully he entered the palace. And David restores him to everything that belonged to Saul and his family and gave him a place in his palace at his table. David restored him. Hey church, when God saved us, when God entered our life, we were in such a situation in our life with God never questioned us. God never asked, Sir, you are a rich man, you are an educated man, you are a good man, you are an excellent man. He did not talk about it. He said, I love you, I save you the way you are. I restore to you the life that you have lost because of sin. God has never questioned how our beginning was. He accepted the way we are. He saved us the way we are. He blessed us just the way we are. He welcomed us into His kingdom just the way we are, isn't it? He never said, you are a naughty guy. So sorry you cannot join us in the church. He did not say, you are a robber, you are a ripper. Rapist, sorry. You, you are an unkind man, you are a thief, you, you are a cheater. So therefore, I don't want to say, but God, how many of you remember the first day you came to know the Lord, He never put a price tag, a qualification over your life. Right? Right? We were all sinners. He accepts us the way we are. Apart from that, He made you and I promises that I will be with you even to the end of the day. <laughs> David restored him everything that belonged to Saul and his family and gave him a place in his palace and at his table. Faster can you, than you can say, Mephibosheth twice, he gets promoted from Law Diba to the king's table. Note this, David could have sent money to Lodiba. A lifelong annuity would have generously fulfilled his promise, isn't it? But David gave Mephibosheth more than a pension. He gave him a place, a place in the royal table. The boy who had no legs to stand on has everything to live for. Can you imagine that? A boy, a man that has no leg to stand on has everything to live for. That's who our God is. You know, to every one of us here, let me say that God is a good God, is a faithful God. No matter how big the giant in front of us stands, no matter how difficult the journey goes, no matter what problem that we go through in life, God is still faithful. Amen? He still loves us the way we are, but He tells you and I, hey, change. Hey, grow up. Hey, be whom God wants you to be. Not say, you know, that's me. No. That's not you. 
That's what your past life used to be. When I'm in the Lord, I must change. When I'm in the Lord, I must allow Him to come true in my life in all areas, not just some areas of my life. You know, we only permit God to work and change our life as we see them fit to ourselves that we allow Him. Do you know, let me just share this with you, do you know if you are 100% totally open to the Lord, you will be amazed what you can do with your life and in your life. Amen? You'll be amazed. It's just many a time that we, we, we just come and, and just have a drink from the well of the kingdom. We just come to church and just get a touch of God. Oh, I'm happy. Hey, God didn't want you to just have a drink, just have a touch, let's have a, have a connection. That's all. He wants you and I to be totally connected. Where you and I are. <laughs> Why? Why did David gave him everything? Why? Is it because he was impressed to David? Was it because he convinced David because somebody coaxed David? No. Mephibosheth did nothing. A promise was the thing that prompted David. The king is kind not because the boy is deserving. The king is kind because he is a kind man and because the promise is enduring. When I make a promise, I keep it. God said, when I make you a promise, I will keep it. I will keep it. Don't tell anyone, just tell yourself. Ask yourself this question. How many times were there promises that we made to God, we made to one another, that we did not keep? I got up this morning feeling much better, but you know, as I'm talking to you, I'm shivering. I'm not that because it's cold. You see my hand? It's because of promise I made to God. I will never fail to attend a Sunday service. No matter what it is, I will never fail to preach on a Sunday service. No matter what it is. I was shivering the whole afternoon and night and the night before. How many of you know the man by the name Absalom? Absalom. Come on, in the Bible. Who is Absalom? David's son, one of David's son. He was one of the oldest son of David. Do you know, 15 years later, after this incident of David brought in Mephibosheth into the palace. 15 years later from this time, Absalom leads a rebellion and forces David to flee Jerusalem. Why? Because David was about to crown the new king, he, he led a rebellion to rob the kingdom and the crown from King David. And David was kicked out of Jerusalem. He has to flee. And Ziba lives with David. Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth sided with the enemy. Do you know? Mephibosheth, after all the kindness, all the goodness that David did to him, he sided with, with Absalom. Thinking in his mind, I better psych him because King Saul is no more. And after Absalom dies, David returned to Jerusalem. Mephibosheth gave David excuses. Why he did what he did. He said that Ziba left him behind. Who is telling the truth? No. What happened? We don't know what happened. But do you know one thing about David? You'll be amazed. The Bible tells us David never asked why. David never asked why. 
to Mephibosheth, why did you sided my son against me? He did not ask why. It doesn't matter to David. His place in the palace depends not on his behavior, not on his judgment. His promise to, to Mephibosheth is based on his promise to his father. Are you with me? Even Mephibosheth sided with his son against him. David still take him back when Absalom dies. Why? Because I made a promise to Jonathan. I will not question him. I made the promise. I will keep the promise. I will keep the promise. Sometimes keeping promises is so tough, isn't it? Don't you think so? Hello? It's so, so tough. Why? Why is David so loyal to the promise he kept to Jonathan? And how? How is David so loyal? Mephibosheth brings nothing but takes much. From whence did, does David query such resolve? Were we able to ask David how he fulfilled his giant of a promise? Come on, one more time. Were we able to ask David how he fulfilled his giant of a promise? He would take us from his story to God's story. You know why he was able to keep his promise? Such a giant promise. You know, tough promises. When we, are, we want to be giant killers, we must be giant promise keeper. We cannot be giant killer if we are not giant promise keeper. That I will keep my promise, my loyalty, my commitment, my faithfulness to God, no matter what happened. No matter what I go through in my life, no matter what I go through in my family, no matter what I go through in my businesses, my career, I will hold on. I will say to the God, I will be faithful. I will not run away from you. I will not give excuses. Why did top David fulfill such a giant of a promise? Because he saw an amazing bigness in the covenant God. That God never failed to keep his promise. You know, I've learned this. I'm trying very hard to learn this as well. You know, every time we kept our promise to God, every time we kept our promise to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to our husband, our wife, or to whoever we made to, when you do that, you actually represent God as a true promise keeper on this earth. That, that brings me to the second thing. The Lord, a covenant-keeping God. David, a covenant-keeping king. God, the Lord, a covenant-keeping God. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Now know therefore the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. One more time I read. Know therefore the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. God makes and never, never breaks His promises. No matter how unbelieving we may be, God never breaks His promises. Never. Never. You know the phrase that God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even to the ends of this earth. You remember the phrase? How many times was it repeated in the Old Testament? 
How many times? Two times. Yeah? How many times was the same phrase repeated in the New Testament? It was also repeated in Matthew 28. Jesus said, go and preach the word. Do whatever you need to do. I will be with you. I will never forsake you, even to the end of the earth. You see, the promises of God is made in the Old Testament, but it's kept throughout the whole Old Testament and right to the New Testament. And to today. He's saying to you and I, hey, whatever I say in my word, whatever I promise you in my word, I will keep them. The Hebrew word for covenant is the word bereath. And the word bereath means a solemn agreement with binding force. A solemn agreement with binding force. And God's irrevocable covenant runs like a scarlet thread, like a long piece of textile through the blood of Jesus Christ. When he made his promise, he sealed his promise with his blood. Jesus died for us when he made his promise. Remember his promise to Noah? Every rainbow reminds us of God's covenant. Don't you think so? Yeah, he made the promise. He will not flood the whole world again. But there are some pockets of floods all over the world. But he made the promise not the whole world at one time, at one go. You know, and, uh, and uh, uh, do you know, curiously, curiously, astronauts who have seen rainbows from outer space tells us that the rainbows form a complete circle around the globe. When the rainbow is seen, it's a round circle around the globe. Amazing, isn't it? He's telling you and I, not only the Indian brothers will have my promise, the Chinese brothers will have my promise, the Cambodian and, and the Russian and the American and the British and, and the Eastern Europe people will have my promise. When my promise is given, it's given to the whole world. It surrounds the whole world. Whoever believes in me, my promise is yes and amen. It is certain. Amen. I will never go back on my word. Nobody is less important than the rest. Every one of us are equally important. God said when I make a promise, it is unending. God's promises are equally unbroken, unending. Abraham, can you remember Abraham? Abraham can tell you about promises. God told this patriarch that counting the stars and counting the descendants would be equal challenges to secure an oath God promised Abraham that he said, I will not abandon you. I will make you the father of all nations. Right? It was a promise. Abraham waited many years. Sarah waited many years. They couldn't believe. What, man, God? So many years we waited, nothing happened. You know, when we lose our patience with God, we try to do things in our own way, bad things happen. Don't you think so? Huh? The Ishmaelites came about and they are warriors and they are fighters, they are killers, even till today. But God will never break His promise. You know, in the Middle Eastern days, when a promise or a covenant is made in ancient East, the promise maker must cut an animal into half. I'll tell you how they make covenant in, in the Middle East, all right, in those days. When they made a promise between a man and a woman, or a man and a man and a woman and a woman, and, and a man with God, there must be an animal that must be cut into two. And the blood must be splashed on both sides. He says, when I make you a promise, it's as good as my life. The blood of the animal represents life. So when I make a promise to you, it is as good as it is a done deal. No going back. Hello? Now, we try to think of ways how to get out of a promise. Don't you think so? Men are so intelligent nowadays, isn't it? We try to think of ways how we can break a promise. You know, you must understand, you know, God, you know, it's not easy. Time is bad. You know, 
I have to earn a little bit more to survive. I have to excuse myself from Sunday service. I excuse myself from cell group. I excuse myself from this meeting and that meeting. Why? So that, you know, I can work a little bit more and get a little bit more. Are you getting more? Are you more prosperous? Can we not believe in the covenant-keeping God that says that I will take care of you? I will provide for you. But I promise you, I will bring it to pass. God takes promises seriously and He sealed them dramatically. In the Old Testament, it's by the blood of the animals. In the New Testament, the Bible says, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I. Amen. Amen. And let me close with this. I don't for a moment intend to minimize the challenges some of you may face. Never came to my mind. Some of you are tired, angry. Some are disappointed. Some say this isn't the marriage of my life I expected to be. But looming in your past is a promise you made. May I urge you today to do all you can to keep your promise to God. Keep your promise to one another. Or to give it one more try to dare to trust again. Why should you? Why should we keep a promise? So that we can understand the depth of God's love. When, you're, when you love the unloving, you get a glimpse of what God's love does for you when you love the unloving, when you love the undeserving, you get a glimpse of what God's love does for you. When you keep yourself in the covenant of God, in the faithfulness of God to do what God has asked you to do, whether it's your promise and your walk with God or with one another, let me say this to you, you will be richly rewarded. You will. You will. I close with this story. Max Locado is a very popular writer. Max Locado shares his personal experience about his mother. Listen here for a while. He said this, My mother illustrated covenant love with my father. I remember watching her care for him in his final months. The father has ALS. What's ALS? Huh? Amyotopic lateral sclerosis. And it means a form of motor neuron disease. Everything starts stop functioning, moving. ALS had sucked life from every muscle of his body. She did for him what mothers do for infants. She bathed, fed, dress him. She placed a hospital bed in the den of our house and made him her mission. If she complained, I never heard it. If she frowned, I never saw it. What I heard and saw was a covenant keeper. This is what love does. Her actions announced as she powdered, powdered his body, shaved his face, washed his sheets. She modeled the power of a promise cap. You know, God calls on you and I to do the same, to illustrate stubborn love, incarnate fidelity. God is giving you a Mephibosheth size chance to show your children, your neighbors, your friends, community, society, what God's love really does in our lives. How many of us have never done wrong to the person next to us? We all do. How many of us have never spoken things that we don't mean to? We have at the spur of the moment. But you know what? Musicians, we get ready. At the call of time in our life, 
we'll tell our Lord, say, God, you know what? I want to try again. I want to try again. I want to try again. Amen. I'll try again. You want to be a giant killer? Then you must be a giant promise keeper. Then you realize to slay the giant give you a booster. Because you know why? You are a giant promise keeper to the Lord. No matter how tough, how difficult it is, I will not give up on my God. I will not give up on my God. You know, for some of you here, some, maybe some of us here, you don't really believe God for who He is. Really. I mean, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Like, we don't really believe God for who He really is, a promise keeper. And that's why we dare not make certain commitment. That's why we dare not make certain sacrifices. That's why we dare not make take certain steps that will change our lives, change our businesses, change our career, change our family, change our future. But today, can I challenge you to dare to believe He's a promise-keeping God. Don't live in your life like you used to be floating here, floating there. Stand on your feet and grow and be whom God wants you to be. Hello? Chinese has a phrase that goes this way. Come back, Lord. Chinese has a phrase that said this way, isn't it? Come back, Lord. Come back, Lord. Come back, Lord. Come back to the covenant relationship with God. Don't run anymore. Don't go anymore. Come back. Uh, is there a phrase like that? Let's come back to the covenant promise, God. Amen. You are more giant to be slain? Be a giant promise keeper. And as we sing the song, can I invite you to stand with me?